No, he said it was like the first one called like the personal extension mm -hmm. stuff. Oh yeah, personal extension is the problem. Yeah, that's it. Exactly, yeah. So they, they don't need to guess it. But it was like a couple of weeks ago, it says we have this week we have a lecture next week. Extension on the cabinet now. Or extension on the proposal. Okay. Let's get started. Uh, today is our uh, last lecture uh, um, and seminars. And uh, then it's, uh, I will be around for any questions uh, uh, with feedback to your assessment. Yeah, so um, I, I will publish as well um, your journal. If you hit over 50 yeah, in the journal itself, in the article, it will be published in the journal. Yeah? So this is a premise system. Um, I, I may have to edit things in your essay if you haven't complied with the template, so be aware of that, but uh, um, otherwise uh, it's normally quite straightforward. So this should be actually published uh, um, before Easter break. So we will have a spring break um, from next week onwards, Friday onwards. Uh, so just when you're coming back from the project, even project, uh, um, then uh, after Friday you have basically a spring break for three weeks yeah, where the university is open but I think the, a, a lot of the uh, lecture, well a lot of the staff normally take holidays to so be aware of that yeah. uh, um, not, not so much with me but uh, others do yeah. okay um, today I really want to uh, um, kind of follow up the, uh, a little bit of the project governance I mean, we had aspects of it already and then dive a little bit into Essex. Um, this is mostly due to uh, um, kind of a call for a professional Essex. This comes uh, mostly from uh, um, Anglo-Saxon countries, really, uh, uh, from uh, America, um, uh, Great Britain. We have taken this as well up, where we have now a lot of professional Essex standards. So I'll talk a little about that a little bit. Uh, um, if you're in a German-speaking country, if you work there at some point, you will see, uh, you will notice the exit uh, Essex mostly through not being there. Yeah? So uh, there, there are not a lot of professional standards actually in uh, uh, German uh, spoken countries as well in other countries. Um, the ethical standards are not really uh, um, written down. Yeah? So this is quite an interesting one. But we come to that in a second. So first of all, I, I want to tell you a little bit where this is coming from. And uh, the, the issues are actually quite concrete. Uh, um, so why are we needing governance? And uh, um, governance is here already a role implication of uh, um, Essex, yeah, as an essential of the project manager. We, we have there actually quite a strong plea. There, there's a professor, uh, the PT, uh, BT professor from Oxford, uh, Ben uh, Flüberg. Uh, he has been actually called in um, to uh, um, yeah, help the UK coming up with better planning methods and he developed a methodology to help project uh, managers and planners to have more accurate uh, forecasts. So what, what uh, was the problem? Uh, first of all, it was the observation that we have been planning for over 300 years and in 300 years there is very little evidence that we are improving at planning. This is a surprise, right? Uh, it was a surprise for me. Yeah. But, uh, okay, so forecast of cost, demand, and other impacts, yeah, this is as well a uh, um, uh, um, uh, you know, criteria or specific specifications that you are agreeing. Uh, impacts of planned projects have remained constantly and remarkably inaccurate for decades. <coughs> and so our planning is, uh, in, if, if you give it plus minus 20%, uh, uh, percent, yeah, which is a lot, it's 50%, then we have in, uh, improved actually slightly. But uh, um, this is of course quite concerning because technically we have now uh, wonderful BIM models and uh, uh, information uh, systems and communication tools that should really kind of uh, flatten this inaccuracy out. But it hasn't happened. So uh, um, there's no improvement in forecasting accuracy seems to have taken place uh, um, despite all claims of improved forecasting models and better data, which we do actually have. Yeah, we, we can actually, uh, if, if you employ it right, uh, um, uh, the sensors or, or um, reporting and data um, sourcing tools, that has not even something to do with, with humans anymore. Yeah? So you don't uh, rely on the 
arguably weak. Uh, I will just uh, state that at this moment as such, uh, uh, not of uh, being an actor and maybe having bias here and, and uh, not recording it right. Yeah, there, there was a concern as well in the literature about that. So even with uh, automated uh, um, uh, data capturing and measurement, uh, um, we still have huge difficulties uh, arriving at the right projection. So this is quite uh, interesting. And if you look at this, um, here Freiburg and uh, his colleagues mostly looked at uh, um, public projects because in public projects you uh, kind of uh, publish the plan. Yeah? It's, it's kind of uh, accessible. This is really why they focused on public projects mostly. So um, they, they looked at what was planned and what was actually built. Yeah? So you can do this. And uh, um, the, the, uh, it was quite uh, shocking. So the transportation infrastructure projects had an inaccuracy uh, in cost forecast in constant prices is, uh, um, so uh, this is like predicted versus uh, actually built on an average of 44.7% uh, of rail projects. Yeah? So this is the amount that kind of uh, um, was inaccurate. 44.7% yeah? uh, uh, of all rail projects, then 33.8% uh, of all bridges, and, uh, um, uh, and tunnels, sorry, so this is uh, one unit. And then, hello, and then 20.4 uh, for all road work. Yeah, so this is quite, and, and those are, if you think about it, in construction, those are actually projects that you can probably uh, um, forecast quite well, you would say so. Yeah, it's not too unique, we often build on a, a, a past uh, basis, and still, nonetheless, uh, this has actually uh, created enormous inaccuracy. Now this is quite dry. This is actually the more important uh, bit uh, from this recent report. Um, they, they did a little bit more research around it and tested uh, um, where this is coming from. Now yeah? they're explaining the inaccuracy. So they te uh, tested basically technical means. Then they looked at the psychology of the people involved. Yeah, it could be that uh, um, uh, uh, people in, in, uh, uh, yeah, in the planning or, or when you come to the project management, you are just incapable of, of uh, thinking in the numbers. Yeah, no, well, uh, uh, this is a joke, of course. But uh, they, they looked at the factors of psychologically, uh, um, politic, uh, political and economic explanations for inaccuracy and forecasting. And uh, what, what was quite interesting is that the technical explanations yeah, that you would uh, normally blame, and it's often used in the uh, um, news media. Yeah, they say that something was measured wrong or that the materials change completely, the pricing, steel prices went up and so forth. Um, but actually, uh, technically, we have this all. Yeah, we have very good data on this. We, we can actually plan it uh, incredibly well. Yeah, so um, technical expl uh, explanations are most common to explain in inaccuracy in terms of unreliability or outdated data, the use of inappropriate forecasting models. Yeah, and and uh, you, you see in 2004, this was still something that was brought forward. That, that is the reason for most projects going wrong. But when you go actually into empiry and you follow the reports up, planned versus ex as actually built, and you look at the design changes and how it was built and, and where additional prices came from, then uh, you, you see actually uh, um, uh, do not actually account for that at all. Yeah? The technical factor is nearly insignificant. Only 3% of the projects, of the failed projects that they looked at, had really inaccurate data or technical means that uh, should have improved and would have actually uh, made the planning accurate. So this is nearly, uh, you can nearly leave that aside. Yeah, it's not a lot. However, the psychology explanations account for inaccuracy in terms of optimism biased. So this is a cognitive uh, predisposition found with most people to judge future events in a more positive light than is warranted by actual experience. Now think about this. You as a project manager, if you buy into a project and you win the bid, there is of course a feeling of like, this is my project, we will be able to do this. Yeah? Uh, Contra to all evidence from former project, I can achieve this. Yeah, so there is certainly a drive uh, um, that kind of brings you on this notion. Um, and, and this is really known as optimum, uh, optimism bias. Yeah, so it's a synergy that you are uh, promoting as well in spoken words and into yourself uh, um, the 
the factors that kind of are pro your project, yeah, that you are promoting as well to your team members. This is well potentially part of your job as a project manager to motivate. But uh, um, the, the dangerous uh, notion of this is that it imbalances your kind of awareness of the whole remit of the project. Yeah, so you, you may actually um, not rate uh, um, the negative points or, or the risky points as high as may be required in this particular project. Now, this is uh, already with project managers, uh, uh, most likely, uh, um, where they, so op Optimus device, this is well something, this is very important for my ethical debate later on, is something that you are not conscious of. Uh, so it's something that is very difficult to realize for ourselves. So we need somebody to talk to or to reflect with and evaluate if we have actually an optimism bias. Uh, um, qu quite sad is that normally uh, pessimistic people are actually quite accurate with projects. I'm not saying that everybody should be uh, pessimistic about everything. Now this would be a, a, a quite grim world, but there may be a feedback opportunity. Yeah, so uh, um, as well with the relevant partners. Then uh, the other one that was uh, kind of like a major hit was the po political explanation and uh, uh, the, they explained the inaccuracy in terms of strategic misrepresentation. Now some of you may have come across it before, uh, um, the term. It, it means literally uh, um, lie. Yeah, so it, it's as blunt as that. Uh, um, and it has to do with how we get our projects. Yeah? So when forecasting outcomes of a project, forecasters and managers deliberately and strategically overestimate, uh, overestimate benefits and underestimate cost in order to increase the likelihood that it is their project and not the competitors uh, or competition's ones yeah? that uh, gain approval and funding. So it's, it's in a way down to the process that we are using for assigning projects. This is very bad. Yeah? What, what does it mean for you as a project manager? What is the dilemma here? If we're thinking about ethical dilemma, what, what does that mean for you? Do, do you see the dilemma? seems as if you can't be honest about the, what you're planning. Yeah. Well, one of the great powers of a project manager when planning is kind of misrepresenting the data to get that project. So lying is a key resource of the project manager, if you simplify this. Yeah. This is a very problematic situation. It, it, it puts you in a dilemma when you're in the workplace. Are you aware of this? Yeah? So, uh, um, what I'm telling you here, that this is not like you are lying just because you are happy to lie. This may be through organizational pressure. Yeah? So this is like consistent pressure being put on you. It's, it's a note from the director talking to you. Uh, by the way, we really need this project to balance our books this year. Yeah? This is kind of a bad start. This is a little bit uh, positive bullying from your director yeah, for you to push on with a... a um, uh, project. Yeah? So um, th this is in a way a, a core issue. Yeah? Uh, um, this has been of course uh, um, been described by Ralf Müller. Uh, um, it's unfortunately not Robert Müller. I, uh, I would have liked that. But, uh, um, because it's a very good piece of writing as well. Yeah? He, he goes into Michel Foucault's uh, work here which is a beautiful read. Yeah? Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend this uh, this semester anymore. But maybe if you go for Easter break to Paris, yeah, and, and uh, you need uh, either wine or extended coffee, yeah, and then you drink that, uh, you, you drink the drink and read the book because it's heavy. Yeah, but uh, um, if you then read it, so uh, um, to literally give you the quote, this is where governance comes in, and this is where the disconnect is between organizational contemporary governance and the project governance. Yeah, but uh, Michel Foucault was aware of this. This is actually bad referencing. I don't reference, I got it there. Um, Foucault's uh, philosophy of neoliberalism, in which individuals are not directly steered by their supervisors, but through subtle forces in the society or company or organization in which they live or work for, uh, to develop 
strategy for creating a domain whereby individuals are responsible and engage in self-care. Sometimes this self-care, so what I've just uh, uh, explained in the former, is driven on the organizational level, yes, you being employed in the company, and it can be so pressing that uh, to be part of this company, you make maybe unethical decisions. Yeah? So this is a common phenomena in our industry. This is not a small number. Yeah? So in the past, you, you have a chance to change the statistics, of course. Yeah? If you are being now a good project manager, and you don't fall into those tricks, yeah, then the statistic will be better in the future. Yeah, but currently, we are still looking backwards, so our statistic is pretty good. Yeah, that is what happens in practice at the moment. Yeah. Then there is, of course, as well, the external environment provides a context in which the project is activated and realized to work on and, to, and for a further project, of course, as well. Yeah, so this is kind of uh, um, where, uh, where we are sitting. And again, I, I postulate once again, yeah, so uh, I will present in a second our ethical codes. After this insight, a kind of a polemic for a project manager. Yeah? So uh, you, you are coming from university, going into pro project management. So those are the people in the company will expect you to get the project. Yeah? So all I'm saying is that there's a huge dilemma in this. Yeah? And uh, it, it's, of course, uh, um, a plea to you yeah, to, to kind of find an ethical uh, theorem that works, yeah, where you don't cross the border and where you are acting legally and responsible. But we'll come to that in a second. And of course, oh sorry, I forgot the, uh, the title. Yeah, so uh, this is the most important part. This is you. Yeah? With great power comes great responsibility. Brings great, uh, okay. So, but you, you get that. Yeah? This is you. Uh, um, it, it brings great responsibility for you. Uh, um, so what and who does it involve? Uh, um, now this goes again back to Müller. Uh, Müller was quite pragmatic about it. He kind of uh, claimed that the project manager is particularly framed by the project organization that is set up by the following. Uh, um, with a few of you, I had already stakeholder management and governance. Um, with a few that I haven't had it yet, this is a snapshot. We go a lot deeper next semester to actually cover that. Yeah? But uh, um, so uh, key groups involved are that, that directly relate to you as a project manager, support of directors, uh, bringing in strategic value of projects potentially. Yeah? So they kind of decide what you're bidding for, uh, wh when it actually becomes a project potentially. Yeah? And uh, um, they are as well responsible, at least in the idealized world, for policy uh, formation. So uh, who to be involved, uh, what resources to be used, and so forth, and, and what the conduct may be. So uh, then you have the project sponsor, a crucial role according to studies that they have uh, uh, um, had. So um, senior in an organization with a past experience, then networking abilities, uh, confident, charismatic, uh, um, hopefully objective, uh, because no bias in your project. But you see already networking abilities, so they may come with their own network that they prefer to work with, which is not a bad thing, but then you have to follow certain procedures. Then the steering group, uh, uh, principal institution, um, so a steering group may sit together from different parties depending on how the project is built. Yeah, if you're working for a client, you may have a client representative on it. You may, if it's a main contractor that you're working for as a project manager, you may have a senior from your main contractor on it and may other uh, responsibility. Uh, um, if it's a public project, you would probably have as well, uh, no way, if it's going to be a public project, but uh, you may have actually other parties sitting on the steering group too. So it's a principal institution for authority, linkage of uh, a role yeah, to the initial project setting, and uh, um, they kind of uh, predetermine the governance infrastructure framework. So they, they look kind of out for you as a project manager. Yeah, and uh, this is a key role. Then we have as well the stakeholders. Uh, um, so, uh, um, uh, Müller had uh, defined that heroically in one sentence, which is pretty good. Uh, all those who have a stake in the project, uh, which doesn't tell us a lot, but uh, he clarifies something to gain or lose through actions of the project. Uh, um, narrow, uh, so this is uh, staff, suppliers, wider communities, and uh, um, industry uh, that, that he kind of summarized under this. And uh, all, all of those are basically involved in our uh, wonderful uh, dilemma. Yeah? 
Now, to, to give you a small snapshot, I have as well a case study oh. that I wanted to kind of describe a little bit where the dilemmas may actually hide. And uh, uh, one such thing is really, uh, um, this was a recent uh, project uh, um, that really looked at uh, uh, power expansion. So uh, you, you may have followed this in the UK. Um, we are building a lot of new power plants and we are extending the energy grid. And from this, uh, um, there they were basically different uh, projects coming in with a whole raft of new supply chain and uh, um, uh, consultancies as well that, that wanted to deliver those. Uh, so here it was really an engineering construction project. So global industry deals uh, with large infrastructure and energy construction. Uh, governance structures encompassed uh, complex internal and external networks. Uh, so there are particular requirements. Uh, so those are uh, products, for example, that you place. So um, like something like a turbine. Uh, uh, um, a steam turbine uh, uh, would be normally uh, ordered as a product. You don't want to assemble it on site, or well, you do to a degree. But uh, um, you basically want uh, um, yeah, uh, the, the parts that are a little bit more demanding being assembled before. Yeah? Then you, you had, uh, um, in UK, sporadic subcontractor opportunism with regard to a social partner agreement. Yeah? This is a particular uh, um, contract form that was used. and. Uh, um, that, that meant basically, as a main contractor, you could bid for the project and then progress it uh, um, accordingly to your supply chain. But there were a lot of specifications. So in the project, they knew that they needed to work with new subcontractors because there were certain parts that uh, they could actually not get from their old supply chain, which is uh, tough. Yeah? Then uh, um, they had many procedures, including project uh, forums and audits, uh, in place, but uh, projects still underperform. Uh, the, the, we come to that in a second. UK uh, projects criticized for being over budget. Uh, this was uh, Her Majesty's Treasury. They put a report out and kind of um, used that as a leveling tool and actually recommended as well to take additional uh, um, measurement options. So, um, yeah, large projects do uh, uh, come with a spin to uh, uh, commerce, uh, so there, there's an optimism bias, uh, um, yeah, and we, we had that before. So here we had really the misrepresentation, which was largely political, so the, the power plants were signed off. What was quite interesting is uh, um, uh, differing, uh, um, uh, this is my former, Yeah, so basically uh, they, they brought a lot of uh, uh, new networks in. So that was a need for supply chain networks uh, view, complex uh, network structures. And uh, um, this meant as well you didn't have a hierarchy. Yeah? So this is actually quite common on larger projects, uh, especially infrastructure projects like this. And it meant that you had self-regulation -reg uh, and uh, um, no temporary overall uh, regulation. Well, when we come to Essex in a second, you, you will see something very uh, uh, bad. Uh, one being that uh, uh, Essex depends on your context. Yeah, where, where you're coming from, what uh, you perceive as values that you uh, hold dear, uh, what values you may want to agree yeah, uh, to, to actually work sufficiently. So the project, actually I, I'll leave you the link uh, um, where we can watch that in the seminars and use it as a discussion ground. Uh, um, and the project was uh, called Lindsay, uh, and uh, um, the, the fascinating involvement was really that the cost pressures, meaning that contractors did not always follow uh, governance regulations, so this is actually nat national regulations, of who should work on the project and uh, to, to what uh, um, yeah, laws they should comply. So it's, it's actually quite common that if you uh, um, get a subcontracted project, especially if you're from another country or another region, that you may bring your specialist team along. Yeah? So uh, um, now the problem with this is that in the UK we have actually legislation that allow it, but you have to illustrate that the skills and competencies are at the right level, and that you, there's as well a social notion, so that you can work in a construction team in the UK. So at that uh, uh, point, they basically overrode that because they had specialist teams. So uh, um, another complaint was really a lack of consideration for the uh, 
uh, wider local economy by subcontracting and by enforcing basically the cheapest deals, they kind of, by implication of course, meant that they had to go for specialist contractors and couldn't wait to train up locally uh, um, trainees or even letting uh, um, companies adapt and, and try out certain parts of the project. Uh, so it was a very strong drive and uh, uh, Fitzgerald uh, um, worked here actually uh, uh, in the UK on this and uh, he was very passionate about it uh, and uh, felt that it was a missed opportunity, which it was. So what, what are the dilemmas that actually come up in a project like that? I, I hope uh, um, you, you get uh, um, uh, uh, the, the idea a little bit of the project. There were agency issues with uh, Total, uh, negation of responsibility. Yeah? So uh, um, literally the main contractor had of course agreed uh, kind of the package, the product that they would do, but they were in the ethics implied and from the laws implied how you're supposed to perform this. But what can we only do with law? When, when do we have law actually? When can we write a law about something? If something goes wrong? Yeah, if something goes wrong, or if we know how we are doing it. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Yeah, so the total way, yeah, uh, it's a, a, a big company, uh, uh, they, they had their own ways of doing it, that were not standardized in the UK. Yeah? So by this, they actually brought in an alternative way of doing it, but the, it, it basically meant that uh, uh, um, the, the performance uh, was uh, um, highly conflicted by uh, um, legislation and there was a lot of uh, issues really with how it was performed. Basically the workers saw how some workers were uh, working in comparison to their working standards. Uh, so this is really where it grinded down in this particular project. Then. Uh, um, the other uh, observations were really technology and change wait for no woman. Yeah. And so this was a notion that uh, um, if you haven't got in your supply chain the, the companies that advance along with the technology drive, then you will be very likely to jump uh, um, uh, from your supply chain on uh, newer supply chains that can actually provide the service. Yeah? And then new agreements uh, to follow Lindsay, which fully details the audit and working for foreign contractors. This was really a movement uh, um, to actually trying to, to uh, um, yeah, bridge a little bit more the uh, um, performance criteria. Yeah. At this point, there, there are the, well, you, you will see later on that there are actually a lot of ethical implications, but at, at this point, this all sounds quite legal still. But what this means for you is that uh, um, there are environmental conditions where you may not comply to a, a project uh, um, that, <coughs> that uh, uh, bring out uh, uh, later on a knock-on effect on your project. Yeah? So in, in other words, it, it has made it actually now a lot tougher to, to uh, um, bring in like subcontractors from other countries. Okay, but with regard to fly work, uh, um, there, there is certainly an improved incentive structure for project managers and improved forecasting. And uh, um, that is a reference uh, class forecasting that they developed. And it's basically the recognition that uh, um, you, you plan it in the usual old fashion and then adjust it basically with the factors depending on where your project category sits. Yeah, so um, if, if you have a look at that reference class forecasting, you will see when you come to a project of 50 million or more and it's in a particular industry sector, now it's a unique uh, building that you're building, then you basically have to bring the factor in, which is quite high. And some projects it's 1.5, so it means you, you have to basically uh, calculate 50% more to actually comply with uh, um, public projects. This is of course kind of a dangerous thing for you wanting the project. I hope you see the dilemma. Yeah? But this is imposed yeah, by in, in UK projects, if you're bidding for larger ones. Uh, uh, for, for larger projects, so you, you will be asked to use actually the reference class forecasting model. Yeah. Okay, this was already touching a little bit on, on uh, um, uh, governance. Let, let's start by project governance. And uh, um, this is a, a little bit of rehearsal for some of you. Uh, um, the, the term comes really from uh, governor, or, or um, this was a very attempt, yeah, uh, I have to apologize to everybody that speaks French, yeah. 
Uh, but uh, every, anyway, the governance comes really from the administrate uh, uh, and um, lead or educate. And uh, in, in the past, this was seen as an honorable role yeah, that you would uh, basically guard, administer, and educate um, uh, your village. So um, there, there was a particular implication with that. Um, the forces that you actually have with the, uh, such and structures, we have covered them a little bit, are hierarchies, um, uh, communi communities, or the society. So uh, in, in some areas, it's actually a few. Yeah, so if you're in the Middle East, you will see it's often uh, different. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, in English, we would probably heroically say tribes, but this is not fully true. But you, you have different communities that come actually together as one society based on the locality. Yeah, so there may be a spatial arrangements. This is not uh, uh, very uncommon around the world, but that is probably where you have it the most often instead of uh, uh, one society idea. Yeah. So uh, then you have uh, markets or the market. Yeah. Uh, um, um, what, what is the difference? What one is like literally the trading place, yeah, and uh, the other one is assuming that there's a global market where you actually uh, um, like have a supposedly uh, um, objective view of what the prices are at the moment. Yeah? So stock markets. Yeah? Then you, you have as well networks that, that influence uh, you. And uh, uh, with this comes, of course, accountability, responsibility, and transparency and fairness that sits within this. Yeah? So uh, uh, quite, quite straightforward in, in a way. Yeah? So, uh, um, oh, we. The, so a project uh, um, can of course underperform, and this is directly linked uh, back to uh, the, the uh, structures, if you want. Yeah? So um, when it comes to cross-functional or cross-company management of many projects, can provide a fertile ground for project failure. In, in some cases, and we will talk about the cases later on, yeah, so for example, if you're in public service and you're on multiple projects, and you're, you're working with one, uh, um, uh, yeah, main contractor may be more than others, then there are potential dangers that uh, uh, you fall in some of the principles that would be uh, called gross misconduct. Yeah. Yeah. But, but uh, we we'll talk about the case later on. So and then you have the poor performance of, uh, of projects can often be attributed to lack of information management, project monitoring and control. This is again the hard notion. And then of course a lack of transparency and proper financial control of organizations has often led to corporate failure and scandal. So this is again a little bit more on the technical side, but a, a key essentials for us. So when, when we actually come to this, uh, there, there is on one side the management of the people. Yeah? So this is to be done successfully requires you to resolve to sets of objectives. And uh, here we are already a little bit in the drive there's actually one objective missing. You know, it's your, your own agenda or your, your uh, own drive in this, yeah, but arguably you're being employed for the objectives, uh, uh, those of the organization and those of the people involved in it. Yeah, and, and this is again the, the notion as well of the stakeholders. And uh, um, if, if you arrive at an ideal uh, way, yeah, then uh, it's of course a negotiation of all the objectives into a uh, uh, one uh, um, equilibrium, yeah, which is uh, uh, quite idealized, but often very problematic. Yeah? So problems will occur when these two separate objectives are in conflict, which uh, uh, will need to be resolved by good management. Uh, so that this means as well consultation, and uh, um, possibly uh, um, if you do it transparently, then there, there has to be a, um, a debate that allows basically an outcome that people buy into, uh, which is a tough one. Now, the, I have a quick part in here as well to, to rehearse a little bit the organizational structure, so bureaucracy and the roles that are actually coming along with it. So we had that to a certain degree. We had the organizational structure influence on behavior. So we had the toll and flex uh, structural differences in organizations may affect individual and corporate uh, motivation with sorts of motivation may be helped or hindered by organizational structure yeah, or as well the, the pressure that you may get in uh, hierarchies, yeah, from may it be peers to compete to the next level, may it be, uh, um, uh, yeah, may it be actually pressures uh, from uh, um, 
somebody that uh, um, directs uh, orders to you or, or um, gives you a kind of project uh, um, or task, yeah, then this has a, a separate influence. Then you have as well, of course, the organizational structure can influence uh, uh, behavior. Um, this is in particular if there are certain reward structures. And so to, to be a little bit more concrete, um, with uh, um, organizational uh, structures, you kind of impose as well what your behavior um, radius is, yeah? so what your role is in this organizational structure, what you are complying to, what the remit of your uh, um, role is, and uh, what behaviors uh, are legitimate to be used in this particular role. Yeah? Do, you, do you have the decision power, or are you enabling something? Yeah? So the, the different notions here, uh, that I wanted to reverse quickly is the bureaucracy has tended to dominate larger modern organizational structures, stresses the definition of roles and their relationships. Hierarchy uh, refers to the number of levels to be found in a particular organization, and organizations may be defined as goal oriented systems seeking effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, th this is uh, organizations are as well, uh, um, I don't want to confuse it too much, but uh, organizations can be as well the association for project management, for example. Yeah, and, and they have many goals for you to be an ethical, uh, um, conscious project manager, yeah, that you perform a certain uh, setting. So this may be an effectiveness and efficiency uh, goal for them. Yeah, so just to give you an idea. Now, the, uh, actually, I wanted to say something else. Uh, the, the bureaucracy is as well, uh, um, this has a negative notion, but uh, um, this kind of prescribed uh, policy uh, uh, notion or, or document notion or guide of conduct notion um, has as well merged into our practice with the ethics. Uh, this is literally, ironically, uh, what I'm uh, going to talk about in, in the uh, next section, yeah, because this is, of course, where the bureaucracy uh, comes around. Yeah. So organizational structure, here um, we had this pen example. I, I hope you will remember that. Yeah? So on one side, we, we, could, uh, make a, uh, we could organize a pen ma uh, manufacturing project yeah? in silos, or we could run it actually in uh, um, a product focus, so literally focus on the pen that we are doing and bring all the people together to assemble it that way. Yeah? And uh, it had very different dynamics. So uh, one was really the structure as a means of attaining the objectives and goals of an organization. Now, so it depends as well how you're organizing it. If there are certain dilemmas, we can actually organize around it, uh, or where we can basically uh, uh, implement safety mechanisms. Then a second, uh, the structure is the extent to which and the way in which organizational members are, co are constrained and controlled by the organization and the distribution of activities and responsibilities and the organizational procedures and regulations. Yeah, and, and here we are touching already very lightly on the ethics. Yeah, so you have to be aware as well what is legitimate. So uh, um, normally your team members will not be very thrilled if you have like a, a total uh, a measurement scheme where they have to report everything and it starts hindering with the actual activity that you're doing. Yeah, so there, there's a fine line of that. So people's behavior and attitudes to work is often influenced by the structure of the organization and that they belong to, and constraints uh, um, and demands of the job can dictate the behavior. It is therefore impossible to explain the behavior of people and organizations solely in terms of individual or group characteristics or motivation. So uh, with this notion, yeah, you, you uh, can kind of see if, if you, well, we had that before, if you uh, manage it too tightly, yeah, if your organizational structure is very prescriptive on the role and you have a small remit, th this may work well for some time, but uh, you, know, you may constrain people, constrain people beyond their feeling of development achievement. Yeah, so uh, um, th there are uh, very dangerous implications about that. So, um, so if you want to uh, uh, look at this in a little bit more detail, uh, um, there, there are work methods to be used, yeah? and, and this depends very much on the setting that you're in. So have a look actually with the teams that you're working, that you have a good idea, or, or ask them yeah, uh, to a degree uh, how they have worked in the past, that gives you normally a very good insight to actually get your head around uh, uh, what is expected. 
and types of communication systems used. Yeah? This is a very important one. Sometimes uh, there, there's expectation of um, decisions being communicated yeah, to, to be uh, kind of followed. Then in other, one, uh, in other systems, it's uh, kind of expected that you are consulting yeah, for their professional expertise. Uh, this is pr probably the most contrasting that comes to mind uh, in my uh, uh, mind at the moment. Yeah, but uh, um, they have very different uh, implications about communication, how you communicate, and where expertise and responsibility sits. Yeah. And then, of course, the performance uh, <coughs> judgment methods. Uh, so, for that, you, you kind of have to agree on a performance. Yeah. And, and uh, do, do you measure just the product? Or actually, do you measure as well how they are doing this? So this is micromanagement, uh, that there's a danger for influence. And then can all influence dictate uh, um, behavior, of course, uh, all these settings have the implication and uh, um, set as well uh, potential um, yeah, uh, um, response area in this. Okay. Yeah, this was a quick reverse of the organization uh, um, structure. This is the official uh, um, ethical leadership uh, guidance. Yeah, this uh, comes from the PMI. Uh, of the PMI, don't worry, we will uh, um, kind of cover that uh, roughly. Has of course uh, um, kind of formulated uh, um, certain uh, um, criteria, uh, namely uh, dignity and respectfulness, uh, serving others, uh, justice, and then community building and honesty. Uh, so this is uh, in the uh, Project Management Institute in America. This is kind of the code of uh, a good leadership. Uh, I think a leader. And, uh, and what was quite interesting is, of course. Uh, uh, Freeberg and uh, uh, colleagues have looked at that as well, and uh, um, they know that there are dilemmas. Yeah? So in other words, if you're following this, you will be likely not to get promoted in your company that you're in as a project manager. Uh, we, we can have a look at the scenarios in a second. Uh, maybe it's for you yeah, to, to uh, make that work. So if you can achieve this, this is a very good start. So um, with dignity and respectfulness, it's uh, ethical, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, um, quite common sense in my mind uh, along those lines. An ethical leader should not use his followers as a medium to achieve his personal goals. But uh, um, yeah, this is a fine line, but you're using them of course to achieve the project. Yeah, and yourself as well. Yeah, but uh, um, he or she should respect their feelings, decisions and values. Respecting the followers uh, implies listening effectively to them, being compassionate to them as well as being liberal in hearing opposing viewpoints. In short, it implies treating the followers in a manner that authenticates their values uh, and beliefs. Yeah, so the, quite, quite a tough one, uh, uh, not, not too tough. Uh, I hope as a project manager you would uh, um, thrive towards that anyway. But uh, um, there, there are implications along that line. And then serving others, an ethical leader should place his followers' interests ahead of his uh, interests or hers, yeah. Uh, he or she should be humane. He or she must act in a manner that is always uh, fruitful for her or his followers. Yeah, so uh, um, again, qu quite uh, uh, clear words on this. Justice, he or she is uh, fair and just. An ethical leader must treat all his followers equally, which is uh, again a, a debatable point. There should be no personal bias uh, wherever some followers are treated differently, the ground for different uh, treatment should be fair, clear, and built on morality. But again, here the question would be again, whose morality? Uh, because uh, it differs, of course, enormously. Yeah. Community building, uh, um, he develops community, and as a can leader considers his own purpose as well as his followers' purpose, uh, while making efforts to achieve the goals suitable to both of them. Uh, he is considerate to the community interest. He does not overlook the followers' intentions. He works harder for the community goals. Uh, so th this is kind of flowery, but uh, um, again, the, the intent is there. Yeah. And then honesty, he is loyal and honest. Honesty is essential to be an ethical and effective leader. Honest leaders can be always relied upon and depend, depended upon. They always earn respect for their followers an honest leader presents the facts and circumstances truly and completely, no matter how critical and harmful the fact may be. He does not misrepresent any facts. 
um, again, th this uh, uh, is again a nice uh, um, direction, but again, this is questionable, is that actually suitable for us as project managers? Yeah, so um, there is a certain implication here that will make it uh, tough as an operational level. Um, I, I want to talk uh, uh, um, and ask you uh, briefly, where did you see those actually being impacted by organizational structure? Do you think it matters, for example, if we have uh, um, yeah, a tall uh, uh, um, hierarchy yeah, or um, a flat hierarchy? Do you think this would actually impact on the ethical principles that we just had? Yeah. Where, where is it? E yeah, okay. Yeah. I think it'd be easier to get away with things with a tall hierarchy because you'd be hidden away. Mm -hmm. It'd be a little less ethical. Yeah, in, in what way? Uh, well, with the flat one, everyone can see what you're doing. You know, you're all on the same level. Your boss is with you on that level. If you start screwing around with numbers or start lying, he's going to notice pretty damn quick what's going on. Okay, uh, so you, you are more removed in that hierarchy? Yeah. Yeah, this is a very good point, and, and it's uh, honesty. Yeah, so you, you may uh, go along with something that you should really flag up. Yeah, and uh, um, yeah, it's a classic phenomena that we have uh, um, seen under the whistleblower yeah. uh, um, phenomena, yeah, that people are actually averse to step uh, uh, forward, especially if you think back uh, from the video two weeks ago. Yeah, if, if others have already waved it through and now it comes to you, and you're like, you know, this cannot be true, you may actually buy into it even more so. Uh, so uh, with a hierarchy, a tall one, you, you are more likely to have this phenomenon. Yeah, but very good. Uh, um, and anything else that comes to mind along those lines? So I think um, a flat organization is better for community building. In, in what way? Um, well, I think there's, uh, the teams are bigger, because you got like on, on the same level, so it's easier to communicate uh, more informally. Whereas if it's a really tall hierarchy, then it's a bit more formal. Yeah. So uh, actually, uh, you, you made a, a, a super link. Um, in, in literature, you will see that community bu uh, building is actually hindered by hierarchy. Yeah, because if you have a senior uh, uh, member and uh, um, issues are kind of uh, um, uh, discussed in front of him, there's often a power aversiveness. Yeah. So hierarchies bring that that you don't feel close, that you don't feel part of a community. But would you say this is true? Is somebody working in a Steep hierarchy. I am. I have a problem though. The uh, um, in our university, yeah, the, it tells you probably a lot about our political dynamics. I'm, I'm very good with our uh, vice chancellor in research, Peter Golding. I really like him. We have the same uh, uh, research interest, and he is a fatter thing that you should do. Yeah? So if you're part of a team, you should not walk over with a team behind you to your Vice Chancellor, yeah, so hierarchy does matter because my colleagues were just like turning around and walking away. Uh, where I was like, "Hello, yeah, we are here. Oh, uh, I'm here," <laughs> and, uh, and it just showed yeah, the uh, um, building the community. If you have steep hierarchy and you are used to just receiving direction from them, so you don't even feed back to them. You're the line manager to feed back to actually coordinate it. Then there's a distance, yeah, just based on the principle that you brought forward. Yeah. But and, uh, the other way around, so if you have a flat, com uh, a flat hierarchy, you have a lot more interaction. You, you have as well this team building aspect a lot more so. Yeah? But uh, it shows you already where the challenge is. Yeah? When you then uh, come to your construction site, you're of course in a certain non-collaborative environment yeah? where our subcontractors may just come in for the job. Yeah? How do you bridge then that hierarchy? There is a hierarchy. Uh, they are coming to do the job for you. How do you bridge that? How do you build this community? This is a very tough one. Yeah. Okay. Any any other? Oh, sorry, I go the wrong direction. Any any other points that would? So this was kind of helping. Yeah. So uh, um, uh, the uh, um, flat structure would help to build the community. Whereas it would hinder in the tall one. Yeah. So the community building aspect. What what others did you see? How, how about the justice? Well, I think if the if it's a tall hierarchy, like everyone's place is uh, more clear. So if you want to say like you know, treat all your followers equally, I mean, 
you probably don't because there's like a certain hierarchy in it. Whereas if it's flat, it's easy to be, to treat people equally. So hierarchies have, of course, an implication. Yeah, there's a power definition, and uh, um, often you're being treated differently at the different levels yeah? of the hierarchy, and it makes this one uh, quite quite difficult, especially if you have a team and have people from different places in our hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah. But what about the first one? Dignity and re respectfulness. Is that impacted? part of the team you, yeah. you belong, uh, uh, whereas uh, in the uh, hierarchy you are an actor, your yeah. role is very uh, um, uh, set in stone and you, you have that limited agreement, which in a way uh, uh, makes it more respectful. Suppose you, you I, the, the way you have said it, I would say probably that it's a decision making power that, that comes in there as well, isn't it? That, that is probably slightly different. So okay, but we have a rough idea. And uh, um, this is really more for you as an analytical tool, you know? uh, depending on the environment that you're in. You, you may be faced uh, with uh, um, certain ethical standards, and uh, uh, um, uh, then on the other side, uh, um, you, you have the uh, problem of actually adapting and calling to this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sh shall we have a 10 minutes break? before we go on. I have more questions now for you because I want to go a little bit into cases that we really familiarize with a little bit different principles. In the end, I have a slide from the APM uh, which is quite uh, descriptive, but uh, I sort of put it in because that, that is apparently at the moment our ethical conduct. Yeah, so um, I hope it will be a little bit more entertaining. The, the first part was quite dry, I have to say.